Hi everybody, Mrs McCarger and I are going to take it in turns to read The Boy Who Grew Dragons. We hope you enjoy it. When people ask me what we grow in Grandad's garden, I think they expect the answer to be cucumbers, tomatoes or runner beans. I don't think they expect the answer to be dragons. But there it is. We go grow dragons. And I can tell you this. They're a lot more trouble than cucumbers. Things cucumbers do not do. Poo in your dad's porridge. Singe your eyebrows. Make a really cosy nest by shredding all your mum's alphabetically ordered recipes. Leave your pants, the embarrassing ones covered in diggers, hanging from the TV aerial. Chase your cat. Drop cabbages on your cat. Try and ride your cat like a rodeo bull. Wake up at 4am every morning by digging razor sharp claws into your forehead. Set light to your toothbrush while it's still in your mouth. Of course, they also don't have scales that ripple and shimmer like sunlight on the sea. Or have glittering eyes that can see right into the heart of you. Or settle on your shoulder with their tail curled round, warming your neck and their hot breath tickling your ear. Nope. None of these things you can expect from a cucumber. Well, not any cucumbers I've ever come across. Maybe a mutant radioactive space cucumber, but not your average garden variety. But dragons, well, they're a whole other story. So who wants to grow dragons? Daft question, yeah? I mean, seriously, who in their right mind would say no? Not me, that's for sure. And not you by the looks of it. But if you want to grow dragons, you need to know what you're getting into. Sure, they're fiery, fantastical and dazzling, but dragons are not all fun and games, not by a long shot. And it's not just the fire and the flammable poo I'm talking about, oh no. Which is why, my dragon-seeking desperados, I'm writing all this down, so at least you can go into it with your eyes open. Because, believe me, you'll need them to stay wide, wide open. Chapter 1 Battle of the Bongle. It started about a year ago, and it was all Grandad's fault. Well, his in the jam tarts. I was just licking the last of it off my fingers when he said, We should grow our own, Chipstick. Jam tarts, I asked. Raspberries, he grinned. Then we could make our own jams for Nana's tarts. We could mix them up too. Strawberry and blackberry. Gooseberry and raspberry. Just think of the possibilities. Delicious. It did make a pretty good picture in my head. A vast plate-sized jam tart with different coloured sections like a multi-topping pizza. And more too, Grandad went on, before I could dive further into the jammy dream. Radishes, beans, onions, cauliflowers, you name it, we could grow it. Suddenly I wasn't so sure it was a great idea. Strawberry and cauliflower jam? Ugh! Anyway, I had enough fruit and vegetables to deal with, what with mum shoveling in my five a day. I mean, she even sneaked dried fruit into perfectly good flapjacks, as if I wouldn't notice. But Grandad wasn't one to let go of an idea once it had fluttered down and settled. So one Saturday morning, we, there we were at the end of his garden, up to our ears in mud, digging away at what looked to me like a monster jungle. In fact, I was beginning to realise why Mum had offered me provisions for my trip to the Amazon. Without the nettles and brambles, my grandparents' garden was probably half as big again and ran all the way down to the fields beyond. I've been wanting to get stuck into this since we moved in, Grandad told me, pausing to catch his breath, but what with one thing and another, I just don't seem to have found the time. I stopped digging and scraped my spade across a clod of mud. I know you have no idea what he was talking about, but I did. I knew exactly what he meant by one thing and another. Sorry, I muttered, because I really was. He rested his arms on his spade and leaned towards me. Now, there's something you should know about my granddad. He twinkles. That might sound weird, but he does. There's a phrase, to have a twinkle in your eye, which means to be bright or sparkling with delight. Well, my granddad has the biggest twinkle of anyone I've ever known. And right then, he was shining that twinkle down on me till I felt warmth flooding every bit of my body. It was like I'd sat down in front of the to toastiest marshmallow toasting fire. Now then, Chipstick, how many times have I told you? What's the deal with families? I smiled. They stick together. Exactly, he grinned. Not unlike jam tarts. Now get digging. 
So I did. The worst thing to dig up was this stuff Grandad called bungleweed. It wound itself around everything, clinging to roots, shoots and shrubs for dear life. Soon enough, I was in an almighty tug of war, boy against plant. And for a moment there, it really looked as if the evil bungle plant overlord might win. But I dug and scraped and pulled and heaved until all that was left was a patch of earth and the strangest looking plant I had ever seen. It was taller than me and my blistered hands would have only made it halfway around the trunk, except it was hard to see the trunk because all of all these long green cactus arms that draped down. It looks like a giant upturned mop head, declared Grandad, but you know, green and spiky and knobbly too. Bizarrely, he wasn't far wrong. Sprouting from some of the cactus arms were vivid yellow and orange tendrils, like bursts of flames, and on each one of those nestled a fruit. Some were large and red and looked fit to burst. Others were small and green and looked new, but all of them had weird spiky pineapple-like leaves. They were so unlike anything I'd ever seen in our fruit bowl at home, I found myself reaching up to touch them. I noticed one of the smaller fruits had already turned red, but the tendril it was attached to was being pushed on by the weight of a few larger fruits hanging above. I gently lifted it and moved it to one side to give it some space. And as I did, I saw something even weirder. Hey, Grandad, I called. It's glowing, like those fireflies, do you remember? Dad said it was a bioluny nonsense or something. He said some jellyfish do it too. Bioluminescence, Grandad corrected. He peered at the red fruit and rubbed a finger across it. Reckon it's just mould, he said. Come on, Chipstick, I'm famished. But what is it? I asked. Grandad wrinkled his nose. No idea, but we can pull it out tomorrow. I looked at the red spiky fruit that was glowing in my hands, and whether I pulled it a little too hard or just chose that moment to fully ripen, one way or another, the fruit dropped from the vivid tendril. Looking at it in my palm, somehow I didn't feel like throwing it into the bonfire pile so I tucked it under my arm before, before following Grandad inside. Later, when I got home, I put the pineapple spreading fruit on my desk and typed strange spiky fruit into the search box on my computer. Pictures popped up and there it was, right next to durian, which smelled like poo apparently. So it was dead lucky if we didn't find those. No. Here it was, size of a mango, red, spiky, pineapple-like leaves. Definitely what I had sitting in front of me. I picked on the picture the, and read the caption. Pitaya, dragon fruit. Yep. Now, it's easy for you because you know there's about to be a dragon. But I was clueless back then. I mean, if someone gives you a fairy cake, you don't expect Tinkerbell to pop out, do you? So I didn't jump up and down screaming, whoopee, I'm getting a dragon. I just left it on the desk and went downstairs for tea. And that probably wasn't the best idea, you know, because of what happened next. Chapter 2. The Jam Roly Poly of Doom Is Grandad planning on growing potatoes on your head? Mum asked when I walked into the kitchen. She pointed to my hair. You've got half the garden in there. Sure, now. And be quick, tea's nearly done. I groaned, but there was no point arguing. Not when Mum had her, I will not be moved even by a runaway rhinoceros look. But I didn't make it to the shower. And not just because I spotted the latest Spider-Man comic, I'd left at the top of the stairs, and stopped to check I hadn't missed anything the six times I'd already read it. But because when I went into my room to grab my dressing gown, I noticed something very odd. The dragon fruit was glowing, properly glowing. I went over and peered down at it. Reaching out, I prodded the spiky skin. It started pulsing orange, red and blazing yellow. And then I remembered what Grandad had said about mould. Maybe it was toxic. I yanked my hand back and stared at it, half expecting my fingers to shrivel up and drop off in some fatal reaction. They didn't, and the relief was slightly sprinkled with disappointment. Not because I wanted my fingers to fall off, but because, when you've read as many comics as me, you can't help but hope that you might just absorb some superpowers when this thing kind of thing happens. Not that this kind of thing had happened to me, ever. The fruit had stopped pulsing now, looked pretty normal, apart from the glow. Before I could prod it again, I heard Mum shouting from downstairs that tea was ready, and if no one was there to eat it in exactly 30 seconds, she was giving it all to the next door's dog, and we could have cereal for all she cared. 
and might have taken more notice of this if the neighbours actually had a dog, which they don't. Just a ferret, and a fussy one at that, so I doubt I'd, it'd eat mum's lasagna anyway. Dad stuck his head round my door and shouted, Tease up, Thomas, then headed off down the hall. I waved. Just coming, Dad. I didn't bother telling him he didn't need to shout. He wouldn't hear me. He wears a ma- pair of massive headphones pretty much permanently. Music is Dad's job and his hobby, and what he does in every second between those times too. He writes music for commercials on TV, and one very low budget film that no one's heard of, let alone seen. But I think he secretly wants to be a rock star, and imagines being discovered by some TV talent show or something. Anyway, I've got used to communicating with him, mainly through mine. Aware that I hadn't made it anywhere near the shower, I swapped hoodies, then ducked into the bathroom, and quickly stuck my head under the tap. Looking at the state of the sink after I'd finished, we'd probably be growing potatoes in there too. Meal times are interesting in our house, not because we talk about interesting things or anything like that, but because of my not yet three-year-old sister, Lolly. In particular, watching my parents trying, trying to feel the flying food and make sure some of it at least goes into Lolly's mouth. Plus, since it's the only time Dad doesn't wear headphones or isn't plugged into his keyboards, Mum seems to feel she has to make the most of it by talking non-stop at about 100 miles an hour. No one could possibly process the amount of information she churns out in between mouthfuls. In fact, I'm pretty sure Dad is actually composing tunes in his head while she's talking, and the nodding Mum takes for his agreement is just him keeping time. After Mum wiped up the lasagna that Lolly had generously shared with the floor, she brought out dessert. She's working her way through a cookbook Nana gave her last Christmas called Great British Puddings. That night, it was jam, roly-poly and custard. Well, lumps of custard. The roly-poly's a bit flat, she noted, as she offered it up to us apologetically. It's meant to be a nice spiral of dough and jam, you know, rather than splodge. She was right. It looked as if someone had sat on it, and that wasn't unusual. Mum is a vet, you see, and although she can wrestle an uncooperative Doberman into a head comb, She can't seem to wrestle pudding ingredients into anything that resembles cake, despite all the shows she watches on TV. Of course, that could have had something to do with her leaving out half the ingredients to make it healthier. Sugar-free cake is not cake in my book. But being bombarded with shows about producing the perfect pudding, while at the same time being programmed to make sure everyone eats their five a day of fruit and veg, makes desserts more difficult for mum than the rest of us. I wanted to say something nice to make her feel better, but I'm really not great at lying. Dad was staring out the window, humming under his breath. I needed him to step in quick before I blurted out something that would probably end up making Mum hurl the whole dish at the wall, which was not necessarily a bad idea. Just then, Lolly grabbed a piece and stuffed it into her mouth and then spat it out. Mum looked horrified. We watched as Lolly picked up another piece, unravelled the dough and happily started licking the jam out of the middle. See, Lolly likes it, I spluttered. Mum didn't look convinced, so I dived for a piece and started making what I hoped were believable yummy noises. Mum sighed and just said, can't you call her Charlotte for once? But she likes being called Lollybob, don't you, Lollybob Bobolob, I replied, still chewing a tasteless lump of dough. Lolly giggled and stuck out two jammy hands to me. See, I said, finally managing to swallow the leaden ball of dessert. It lodged in my throat and I had to take an enormous gulp of water to get it down. Mum turned and while she was wiping Lolly clean, I grabbed the rest of the roly-poly pudding from my bowl and stuffed it in my hoodie pocket. Thanks to my sister, I was going to be saved from eating any more. We stick together, me and Lolly, even without jam. Suddenly there was a loud thump from upstairs. Mum stared at the ceiling. Whatever's that? It's probably just Tom Tom messing with my stuff, I said. That cat is like a furry wrecking ball, Mum moaned. Go and sort out your pet, Thomas. I didn't need telling twice. Not with half a roly-poly still sitting on the table, staring at me menacingly. I raced upstairs. Tom Tom, come out, I said crossly as I stepped into my room. I looked around for the ginger cat, ready to give him his marching orders, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. Then I noticed the dragon fruit, for it wasn't where I had left it on my desk. It was on the floor by my bed, and what's more, it had grown.